All right, welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your uh, I, I am your host and moderator for tonight's epic debate. My name is Donnie, and tonight we are debating the topic of evolution. This is the much anticipated debate on is there reasonable evidence for evolution? And before we get into the five minute opening statements, what I want to do is kind of break the ice a little bit, get to know. Uh, these debaters a bit, although they are no strangers uh, to debates and uh, this specific debate community. So Atheist Jr., it's been a little while since you've been here on the show. So uh, why don't we start with you? A little bit about yourself, how you've been, and also a little bit about your channel. Oh, I'm good, Donnie. Thank you so much. So uh, my channel is just mostly making response videos uh, about younger creationism, religion, um, and the way that I see that different people can use religion in a way that is harmful and the effects of younger creationism on our public school education system, on uh, our society in general, and having discussions with people, uh, religious and atheists, talking about faith, uh, life, and just different things. So it's pretty much it. Okay, well, AJ, I appreciate the introduction. Your channel is linked in the description box for people to check out. And uh, Kent, uh, over yeah. to you. Uh, you were just here uh, last night. You'll also be here again tomorrow, so you're a busy guy. When it comes to the channel itself, we've got four debates in three nights. So for the debate attic, uh, you know, this is uh, the, the summer of debate. So Kent, how you been? A little bit about yourself. How's everything at Dow? Well, my name is Kent Hovind. I've been a Baptist preacher 48 years, taught high school science and math 15 years. We have a ministry in Lenox, Alabama called Dinosaur Adventure Land, all about dinosaurs in the Bible and how stupid evolution is. For those who think they came from a rock, they need help and we're to help them. People visit from all over the place to come see our place. It's all free. I've been sick for four days and I'm much, I feel much better, but I'm still coughing. So I apologize for that, but I'll try to do my best to minimize it. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to get Atheist uh, Junior converted and get him into God's family. That'd be great. That's my goal for tonight. Well, Kent, I appreciate that uh, introduction there, brother, and glad to hear that, that you're feeling better. So no worries. No worries. Okay. Well, for the audience sake, uh, the format is going to be uh, relatively the same format that, w w that we've been doing over the last several debates. It's going to be more free-flowing, easygoing, and, and organic in terms of the discussion, focusing on one topic or one question at a time. Uh, but before we do get into the discussion itself, we're going to do five minute uh, intros just to kind of set the foundation for tonight's discussion on evolution. And uh, AJ, we will start with you. So I am going to give you the floor for five minutes. Of course, if you need to screen share, let me know. We can get those slides up there as well. And uh, before I forget, as I'm getting your slides up there to the audience, uh, just make sure you're tagging me with your questions at Standing for Truth. And that way, uh, that way I won't miss them. And also just give me a thumbs up in the live chat for the audience that is uh, letting me know that the audio, video and, and everything is, is going good. So, okay, that being said, AJ, we're gonna hand it to you for five minutes. All right. Uh, thanks, Donnie, for hosting this debate and Kent for agreeing to rematch. So the title of this debate is Evolution on Trial. Uh, is there re reasonable evidence for evolution? Of course, it's not on trial in the scientific community where there is no debate. At some point during this debate, you're going to hear Kent say that the purpose of this debate is for AJ to provide evidence for evolution. I'd like to see it. There's a lot to unpack in that statement, and there are some problems with it. Kent has already said that he will say until the day he dies, there is no evidence for evolution. So Kent's already made up his mind. He's decided, and Kent thinks that he's an authority on what is or is not scientific evidence. I'd like Kent to explain what gives him that authority. Why are they teaching this? I think when you teach the kids evolution, that is child abuse. You are lying to them to get them to believe a theory. There is no evidence for evolution. If you disagree with But there's also another problem. Me and Kent are talking about different things when we use the word evolution. When I say it, I'm referring to the scientifically accurate definition, which is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified 
from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. This is the definition you'll find from Google. And evolution by natural selection is about biodiversity, and it encompasses microevolution, which is variation within a species, and macroevolution, which is variation between species. Now, Kent already says that he accepts microevolution, so that's half the battle right there. Although saying that you accept microevolution is still saying that you accept evolution. But my question is, how can we debate on evolution if we can't even agree on a definition? So Kent Hovind's quarter million dollar offers. Years ago, in the early 2000s, Kent posted an offer on his website claiming to offer a quarter million US dollars to anybody who could provide evidence for evolution. Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis commented, AIG would prefer that creationists refrained from gimmicks like this. But if you read the fine print when you actually went to go and claim that offer, you had to prove the following. You had to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the process of evolution is the only possible way the following observed phenomena could come into existence. Time, space, and matter, planets and stars, Matter, which created life by itself, early life forms learned to reproduce themselves, and, ma and that major changes occurred between these diverse life forms, i.e. fish changed to amphibians, amphibians changed to reptiles, and reptiles changed to birds or mammals. So you have to assume that a god already exists, in which case he's omnipotent and could do anything he wants. So there's nothing, and you have to prove that God didn't do it this way. Another quote is, it is your job to prove what is being taught to our kids as fact. All six meanings of the word evolution above is indeed a fact. So is this the only thing that would qualify as evidence to Kent? Not on paper. Let's observe it. That's what science is. Get in the laboratory, make your chimpanzee, produce longer arms, longer arms, and turn to a human. That doesn't happen. So Kent wasn't looking for evidence back then, and he's not really looking for it in his debates either. That's why he defines evolution as starting with the creation of the entire universe instead of Earth having already been formed with life already on it. His definition is a straw man. He's conflating things that are not the same. He claims that evolution says that one animal gives birth to a different kind of animal. So he wants to make it seem like there's a legitimate debate in science between younger creationism and biological evolution by natural selection. That's why he reframes the definition of evolution to start with the creation of the universe. So my first question to Kent in this debate would be, what would you actually accept as evidence of evolution? Because He's been presented a lot of the similar lines of evidence many times. He's done almost 300 debates, and he always hand waves away huge categories or huge scientific fields outright, like paleontology. Just no fossil could possibly count as evidence. No fossil you could ever present can't counts as evidence. No DNA counts as evidence. So my question is, what would count as evidence? And that's where I'll end my statement. Okay, AJ, thank you so much. That was um, perfect timing, actually, between four and five minutes. And I do appreciate the visuals there. Let me get rid of the uh, full screen. Also, to the audience, I am all caught up on questions. And, of course, we've already got a big audience. So if you do have questions, just please make sure uh, you're tagging me. Okay, that being said, we're going to now hand it to Kent. Kent, you have equal time, five minutes for your intro. Then we'll get into the discussion. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, it's good to uh, get to know a little bit about AJ. I looked at his channel for the first time today. It says he's five foot one. And April 21, 21, he came out as online as bisexual. He's a makeup artist. So uh, it's good to know. And he sure likes to make fun of me on his channel. Most of, my, most of his videos are about me. I'm living rent free in his head. That's okay. So not a problem. Come visit our dinosaur adventure land where God gets the glory for his creation. We're in Lenox, Alabama. We'll get into that some other time. Okay. There's our science center. You can. <laughs> My objection is that the evolution, the textbooks teach the kids with charts like this, that humans and pine trees have a common ancestor with whales, which was a single cell creature. So it's way more than AJ wants you to think. It's just biological variations, you know, within the same kind. 
micro and macro. There's way more to it than that. I would like any evolutionist to answer the question. The standard definition of science is the knowledge man has accumulated by observation, experimentation, and testing. Nobody's ever observed a dog produce a non-dog or a cow produce a non-cow. Nobody's ever observed that. But the standard definition of science is observation. So why do you, put, why do you make these charts showing that the whale and the horse and the human and the pine tree have a common ancestor. This is not observed. This is not science. This is a religion. Evolution is a religion in every meaning of the word, okay? How do you define the word evolution? We'll get into that in a second. How do you define the word species? Charles Darwin's book titled The Origin of Species is really not what the argument is, okay? Uh, 20 times the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. So if they're able to bring forth, they're the same kind. There's 250 varieties of cows. Nearly all of them can interbreed and bring forth a calf. The cows and the pine trees cannot bring forth anything, okay? What's the best evidence for any plant or animal turning to a different kind? So I define evolution with six different meanings, and it drives guys like A.J. crazy. Uh, well, it's a short putt, not a drive, but okay. Cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. You guys have to have something to evolve. Where did time come from? Where did space come from? Where did matter come from? Then you have to have chemical evolution. If your Big Bang theory is true, which it's not, Big Bang only produced hydrogen. Third theory of life's origin known as chemical evolution. Chemical evolution, Harvard University, okay? So you have to have chemical evolution, the formation of organic molecules. This has never been observed. It's not part of science. You don't have a complete theory. You guys want to skip this, I know, because it's, it's embarrassing because there's no answer for it because it didn't happen, okay? But chemical evolution, chemical evolution is found all over the place. That is an essential part. You have to have your Big Bang produce hydrogen. The hydrogen has to turn into lithium and helium and all the different elements, all the way up to uranium, platinum, silver, gold, all that stuff. You can't fuse past iron. So <clears throat> then you have to have stellar evolution. The stars have to evolve and the planets. We're living on a pretty good sized planet, a little less than 8,000 miles in diameter. Where did all this matter come from? Where, how did the planet form? Stellar evolution is all exactly part of the theory. Stellar evolution, stellar evolution. We don't know how a single star managed to form. They never have. No, nobody knows how a star forms. They dream about it. How do stars evolve? They have these imaginary life cycles, but that's not science. Then you have the origin of stars is an unsolved problem. AJ wants to skip all these, I know, and I know why, because they don't have an answer for it, but you don't have a complete theory and you shouldn't be teaching it to the kids in school until you can explain all this stuff. How do stars evolve? No one knows how star formation proceeds. We see stars blow up once in a while, but we've never seen a star form. There's a lot of stars in the universe, 70 billion trillion, that 70 sextillion stars is the current estimate. That's the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones we don't know about. So there's a lot of stars out there. The Bible says God made them. I don't have a hard time believing that. Now, that's a religious belief on my part. I'm not asking everybody to pay for that to be taught, like you guys are asking for yours to be taught. But the Bible says clearly that God made the stars. So I believe that, okay? You guys think the stars made themselves from nothing. I think that's stupid, real stupid, okay? Should be 9.7 million new stars forming every minute for 13 million year, billion years. Never seen, never happened. Then you have organic evolution, the origin of life. How did life get started, AJ, from non-living material? That's an essential part of your theory, or organic evolution. It, it, there's nobody's got an answer for this. If, it, if it's so easy to make life, non-material, non-living non material come alive, do it again in the laboratory. I want to watch it this time. Nobody knows how chemicals turned into a living cell. Then we could talk about that for a long time. Then you finally have what we call macroevolution, variations changing from one kind of animal to another. That one's never been observed. Macroevolution. All we have ever observed is what we sometimes call microevolution, and I don't like that word, it's a bad term. We see dogs produce a variety of dogs. They're still dog. Where's the evidence of a dog coming from a non-dog? I challenge you to show me that tonight. Thank you, Mike. Okay, there we go. Five minutes uh, on the dot from the both of you. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for giving me an, an easy job tonight so far, that is. Okay, well, we're jumping into just a free-flowing uh, discussion now, focusing on one question and one topic at a time. I'm looking forward to this. This should be fun. Okay, AJ, we're going to hand it to you since Kent just ended with his five minutes, and we'll let you uh, choose the direction uh, that, that we should take for, for the discussion. Go ahead. Okay, could you show my uh, screen share again? So uh, Kent said that he's not trying to get uh, his 
theory of young earth creationism talk in public school taught in public schools but i would like to play these video clips to refute that buy a stack of these from our ministry and pass them out to every kid and say kid i'll give you ten dollars if you'll watch this this one right here has helped tens of hundreds of thousands of public school kids it's also part of our seminar series if you want to get the whole thing for 50 Bert can help you get creation materials into your public school libraries. So he's just wrong when he says that he's not trying to get young earth creationism into the public school. That's not true. But it was an impressive gish gallop that Kent went on for the past five minutes. Kent complains in every single debate. He accuses the other person of bringing up multiple topics. And yet his definition of evolution, like you just saw, is six topics at once. We went to star formation, abiogenesis, macroevolution, microevolution, chemical formation, element formation, and planet formation. That's more than one topic. So I'm not sure how Kent can justify constantly saying one topic at a time when he says, let's debate evolution, and he brings up six different scientific fields. Okay, Donnie. Do I get a chance yeah, to respond? That, He's already got course, two things. Yeah that, was a, yeah, that was a minute and 20 seconds, so go ahead. Well, Ken. it's free-flowing discussion. Forget the time. He's already got two top two topics going that I don't want, uh, I do want creation taught in public schools, and now about the definition of the meaning of the word evolution. AJ, your religion of evolution is the only thing taught in public schools. It is a religion. None of these five have ever been observed. It is a religion, but it is taught. So I want all the public school kids to be able to see both sides. I think all the teachers should see both sides. I think they should simply avoid the topic of origins altogether. It, evolution has nothing to do with biology. You can teach the kids all the bones and the tendons and the muscles and the ligaments and the organs and the functions without mentioning evolution at all. But you guys who believe you came from a rock will not leave that out. You want to sneak that into biology class. Evolution has nothing to do with biology. So since you've got it in there, I think all the schools either teach both sides or teach neither. But right now, it's not that way. All the schools teach only one religion, and that's the religion of evolution. Yes, I think that's wrong. I think that's evil. I think you guys who believe you came from Iraq should go start your own private school and teach it to those who wish to pay and come learn it. But I resent paying, and everybody else that I know of resents paying for property taxes, which go toward the public schools when they teach a religion of evolution. It does not belong in schools. So as far as... Uh, me teach creationism in schools. If you're going to teach evolution, then yes, we should better get both in there. Otherwise, take evolution out. I'll be happy. So you do want young earth creationism taught in public schools? No, I don't think there should even be public schools. But if there are, they shouldn't teach evolution. Yeah, listen to me. If they're going to teach evolution, then yes, they should show all sides. Well, they are you teaching evolution. You want exclusive rights to the kids' brains to make them believe like you believe, that there's no God, we came here from a dot of nothing exploding. That's not science. So I have said many times, if we're going to have public schools at all, they should avoid the topic of origins. Since they don't want to do that, when well, the other option is teach both. Either teach both or teach neither. How, what do you not understand about that? I understand that you're saying if they teach, are going to teach evolution, which we do, although I live in Texas and they didn't teach evolution when I was in high school because creationist activists you know, flooded the judges with Republican senators, um, but you're saying if they do teach evolution, then we should teach both. So you do want creationism taught in young earth in, in school. You just said it and you just said it in the clips I showed. OK, I'll say it again. If we're going to teach origins at all, which is unnecessary which for biology, then, yeah, teach both or teach neither. What is going on right now is completely one sided. It's not fair. Does it would you be a, would you be concerned about students learning about creation? Does that bother you? Uh, yes, I would. Why? Because creationism is based on one specific version of Christianity. And I don't think that one specific religion should be taught in a public school over all other religions. I mean, would you be uh, comfortable if Muslim creation was taught in a public school? AJ, that's what they're doing now. They're teaching this stupid religion right here in all the public schools. It is a religious belief. Do you believe you are related to uh, seaweed? 
like this chart shows. Well, hold on a second. One topic at a time, Kent. Okay. Well, this is the religion that's being taught. This chart is nothing but religious. Nobody's ever seen a frog produce a non-frog or a whale produce a non-whale, but they've got lines on paper connecting them back to an amoeba. This isn't science. Nobody's ever seen an amoeba produce a non-amoeba. Never. But they got an amoeba leading to a human and a pine tree and a frog and a scorpion. Do you believe you're related to seaweed like this chart shows? Is this your religious belief right here? Well, I've never seen a mountain form in front of me. Does that mean that mountains don't form or aren't forming now? So you're avoiding the question by saying, well, maybe it happens yes. too slowly to see. Okay. Do you believe no. an amoeba turned into a human over billions? I'll give you tr quadrillions of years. Would an amoeba ever turn to a human? Do you believe that? No, I don't believe that. Well, then why, you let, why do you like charts like this in our school system? This is not science. This is pure propaganda. Yes, you didn't this answer is my religion. question. What now? You didn't answer my question. If I if I can't see if I can't see a mountain form in my lifetime, does that mean that mountains don't form or aren't forming? Well, that's a straw man. You're drawing attention away from the obvious here. That's a non-living material. Rock formation. We know how rocks and continents are moving and uplift and uh, continent, subduction, plate subduction. Yes, I understand that thoroughly. I taught her science 15 years. But this we don't see. We can see examples of mountains forming. We can see some happening rapidly, whether it be uh, <coughs> the various different mountain building processes with igneous rock or metamorphic rock, I understand. But this chart shows an amoeba turning to a human, and nobody's ever seen that, but you're trying to avoid answering the simple question by saying, what about mountains forming? You're diverting attention. Do you believe the amoeba turned to a human and you are related to seaweed like this picture shows? Do you believe no. that? Just a yes or no? No. You don't believe you're related to seaweed. Good. Well, then would you help me get this kind of stuff out of the textbooks? Because this isn't question. science. What now? That wasn't the question, Kent. Are you saying that that chart says that the earliest single-celled organisms were modern amoeba? Well, they're showing a single-celled creature. Let's see. Uh, I got all kinds of charts here. The family tree. Oh, no. Geologic column. Uh, I got 20 million slides here, but the textbooks are full of this kind of stuff. The, there you go. These family trees, 85, shows humans and <coughs> Australopithecines and Homo erectus all connected by lines to a common ancestor. Do you believe you're related to a lemur? Would that be a simpler question? Maybe you can answer. Yes, but I want to stay on the question previously because okay. the this earliest is a religious single belief you want re you want your religion taught in the schools. I resent that. Go start a private school. It's easy in Texas. Start a private school and teach the kid. Hey, you're related to a, a, a monkey. Teach them that. But that's not science. They show this kind of stuff, and it's pure propaganda. This is a religious belief. Here we go. Single cell creatures turning into humans. It happens. It's in all the books. I okay, think this is no, there's nothing scientific about these charts. Nothing. This one shows the birds, the reptiles, and the mammals have a common ancestor. Wow. Do you believe you're related to a snake? Chart says okay. you are. One topic at a time, Kent. So the okay. earliest single-celled organisms were not amoebas, not in the slightest. Okay. Amoebas okay. are super specialized creatures. Amoebas are highly derived eukaryotes. The first cells, first single-celled organisms were anaerobic prokaryotes. So, and how do you know that? Because of the taxonomy. Well, you're using a big word there. So because we can put this thing into a chart and, and call it, uh, and, and claim it happened, claim it came from that, therefore it's science. It's not. We don't see this happen. No single-celled creature has ever been observed, whether it be amoeba or a eukaryote of any kind. No, but no single-celled creature has ever been observed turning into anything else. It's not observed. E. coli has a generation time that's really short. I think you get five or six generations per day. We've watched it for years and years. It never produces anything but E. coli. Do you believe a single-celled creature turned into all the creatures that we see today? Do you believe these kind of charts are, is, is this science or is this a religion? No, I don't think that a single-celled creature turned into multiple different animals. Because you're talking about one single-celled organism that turning into 
a bunch of other animals. That's not what evolution describes. It is exactly what they say, that single cell creatures slowly turned into humans and bears and starfish. This is what they teach, and this is my point. And you're trying to very skillfully avoid answering the simple question. Do you believe these charts are religious? They, this, is this science? Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Nobody's ever seen a monkey produce a non-monkey, or a chimpanzee produce a non-chimpanzee, or a baboon produce a non-baboon. Nobody's ever seen a human produce a non-human. Nobody's ever seen a, a single cell creature produce anything other than same kind. The Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind, but you wish to believe, capital B, believe, that all the life forms came from a common ancestor. And I'm just saying most people with a brain resent that and think it's a religious belief, and you want your religion taught at taxpayer expense and nobody else's religion taught. So if you're going to teach yours, then I'm going to try to get mine into the schools any way I can. I'm going to pass out DVDs. I want every kid every teacher to know the truth. So when the textbook says, well, you're related to an amoeba, uh, they'll all laugh at it. That's the best we can do right now. Well, thank and, you and for before admitting. Before you respond, AJ, I want to give you plenty of time. I've just okay. now got about 20, at least 20 people in the chat saying that uh, we should keep it on topic as much as possible. Not saying that this uh, isn't a fantastic discussion so far, but again, you know, what is the best evidence for evolution or is there reasonable evidence for evolution? So maybe let's, let's try and uh, shift our focus e even slightly if we can. Gentlemen, go ahead. Okay. Well, I have some slides uh, of evidence. But real quick, uh, I would just like to ask, Kent, what do you mean uh, when you say we've never seen a dog produce a non-dog? What do you mean by produce? That means have babies, have sex, produce a baby. Only happens with okay. male, female, by the way. But go ahead. So um, does that mean that you think evolution teaches that a dog could give birth to something like a cat? Evolution, the charts show very clearly that dogs came from something that was non-dog. That's what they show. I don't think that's science. I think that's pure religion. This one shows mammals like humans and birds coming from a common ancestor and crocodiles. That's not science. But you know that those charts aren't talking about an animal giving birth to another animal. Do you think the ancestral amphibian at the bottom of this chart slowly over millions of generations gradually gave birth to humans? No, and we, that, that's not possible to gradually give birth to something over millions of oh, generations. Brother, you can't be this dumb, AJ. You know full well what I'm talking about. Your textbooks teach that all the animals slowly change to other things. Slowly, bit by bit, this early reptile turned to a bird. This is what the charts show, whether it took one generation or 10,000 generations. Nobody's ever seen a reptile produce a non-reptile at all. This one shows birds coming from reptiles. That's not science, not even hold common on. sense. You're conflating two different things because on one hand, you're talking about an animal giving birth to, to its offspring, and then you're comparing that to charts that talk about changes over millions of years with populations of animals over many generations. Okay. So you're conflating so, these two different things. So you believe the birds gradually Turn, reptiles gradually turn to birds over millions of generations. Where is the scientific evidence for this? Nobody's ever seen any of it. It's imagination. That's all you have is SpongeBob imagination. Give me your address. I'll send you one. You need one. We'll keep on your dresser. Just I'm not going to give you. I'm not going to give you my address, Kent, because you'll give it out like you gave my last name. Yeah. So give me um, a, give me a post office box, then. I don't care. I'm not. Believe me, I'm not stalking anybody. I want to get you converted. You believe one of the dumbest religions in the history of the world. Nobody's ever seen any animal or plant produce offspring that would be considered a different kind by anybody with one functioning brain cell. It just doesn't happen. Only in your imagination. It happens so slowly we don't see it happening. Well, science is what we can observe, study, test, demonstrate. Do it in the laboratory. Get a bunch of reptiles and slowly turn them into birds again. Turn a reptile scale into a feather. Just start with that let alone the hearts are different, the lungs are different, the reproductive system different, the DNA different, just the scales turning to feathers. It doesn't, it's not science. It's all you, you believe in it, and I admire your faith, but your faith is misplaced. These charts are not science. They're propaganda. That's all I'm saying. They got them all lined up here going back to a common ancestor. 
Do you believe kids should be taught stuff like this? Should this chart be included in a public school textbook? Sure, but it's a good thing that you mentioned that. Can, uh, Donnie, can you show my screen share again? Because, yes. Uh, this yeah. is actually relevant to the slides I, I prepared. So feathered animals uh, did evolve from animals with scales and feathers as well as hair and fingernails are made of the same protein as okay. scales. One, one topic at a time. You're, t you're making a statement there. Put it back up if you can. Feathered animals evolve from animals with scales. This is propaganda. This is not science. Nobody's ever seen any feathered, uh, any animal with scales produce anything other than babies with scales. So where's the science? You're claiming this is evidence by making a statement. That's not evidence. I'd like to see this happen. Where is the scientific example of any animal with a scale having a, feather, a scale slowly change into what looks like was gonna be a feather? Where's the science for this? You making the statement isn't science. This is propaganda. Well, if you would let me finish, then I would okay. get to my evidence. Go ahead, go ahead. So Where's the evidence? On, on the left, we have uh, a picture of the common roach, which is a fish that has scales. And on the right, we have a snake uh, that also has scales. So this is a fish and a reptile. And here we have a close up of a pangolin, which is actually a mammal. So if you look at the structure of the feather, you can see that it's actually got a lot of similarities with pangolin scales. So feathers are a specialized type of scale. Human hairs are also, in effect, modified from scales. So are fingernails. So scientists actually did uh, a experiment where they were able to turn scales into feathers by turning on and off key molecular circuits at critical stages of scale growth and development. So uh, they were able to put, they were able to take the uh, embryo of an alligator and add a chemical to it and start growing feathers. So this has actually been done in the lab. Scientists in the have lab. converted Does that scales. Therefore, mean it did happen in nature. That's your evidence. You said that it's only science if we observe it. So this is science according to you because it's been observed. Well, it's been observed that people can put nuts and bolts and, and parts together and make a car. But the question is, can the car make itself? You're claiming, and I'd like to see the evidence. I'd like to read, read up carefully on what they actually did in the laboratory. You're claiming that they turned f scales into feathers. I don't believe you for one second, okay? But if they could do such a thing, again, that wouldn't prove it happened by itself in nature. I got pictures here someplace of the scales and feathers. Uh, you can put your feather, your picture back up of the feather. Feathers are incredibly complicated. They have little barbules that hook together so that the, 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 it locks together and makes one coherent unit like a parachute so the bird can fly. And if you think scales, you compared the pangolin scales and some other scales. Sure, a lot of animals have scales. So, some have different types of scales. They're designed to have scales that work for what they need to work with. But nobody's ever seen a scale turn to a feather. Nobody's ever seen this happen. You believe it, which is fine. I admire your religion, but you don't have science to back that up. There's no scientific evidence in nature of a scale turning to a feather. You just believe it and you expect everybody to pay for it and be happy about it. I'm sorry, I'm not happy about it. Uh, well, well, you, um, Dinosaur Adventure Land is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so you don't have to pay property taxes. So your your property taxes don't go to the public schools. So you're not paying for evolution to be taught. Are the atheist are the atheist organizations also uh, tax exempt? Many of them are nonprofits. Yes. Okay. There you go. Thank you, sir. So I've got so many slides here to get. But if you believe scales turn to feathers. This would only be one of 10 trillion changes to turn a reptile to a bird, okay? And it's not observed. But if you believe that, that's fine. But my point is, this is not part of science. It shouldn't be taught in schools. It's part of a religious belief. But they got the charts here showing, here we go, uh, all the charts, the family trees, show all these creatures changing to something else. Nobody ever observes this in the laboratory to make it happen in the laboratory, like a bunch of carpenters making a house. That takes intelligent input. We don't see it. Uh, so I'm sorry, what you have demonstrated is clearly to the audience, I think, that you believe 
reptiles turn to birds. Okay, believe all you want. My point is, that's not science. Science is what we observe. All the reptiles every, everybody's ever seen make babies, and make babies that turn out to be the same kind. I mean, a four-year-old will tell you it's the same kind. Snakes have baby snakes. Lizards have baby lizards. They don't change at all, slowly, gradually, at all. None. I can't find my slides right now, but anyway. So you had a great picture there of yourself, of the, how complicated the feather is with the little barbules that hook together. That's why the birds have to preen their feathers. Uh, some of the, many of the feathers are the flight feathers. The shaft is off center. One side's longer than the other. So it opens and closes like Venetian blinds. On the upstroke, when they lift their wing up, the feathers open to let the air go through. On the downstroke, the feathers close like Venetian blinds. How long did that take to evolve? Flight feathers and contour feathers for the body are, are very different and warm feathers. So the, just the feathers are so complicated. I just think you guys ought to admit, you know, we believe by faith that animals can change to something else, but we really don't have any science to back it up. I wish you guys could see it's a religious belief, but you don't believe, you, you want us to pay for that to be taught. I'm sorry, not, not, uh, not cheerfully for me. So meanwhile, we will get my videos into every public school we can, every school teacher, thousands and thousands and thousands of public school teachers and students do not believe this propaganda like these charts show. And I, I encourage the kids, if this comes up on the test and they say, boys and girls, did reptiles turn to birds? You could say, kids, the textbook says blah, 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 but I don't believe it for a second. Not a thing they can do about that. This is not science. This is propaganda. Okay. So and I know, I know you'd rather your propaganda was in the public schools than that. But animals, uh -huh. reptiles are just air-breathing vertebrates that are covered in scales, bony plates or a combination of both. So birds are reptiles the same way that um, everything descended from a vertebrate is a vertebrate. A bird is a reptile. So I don't know why you're saying that we've never seen a reptile turn into a bird like birds are reptiles. How can you make such a statement? How far did you get through school anyway? You think birds are reptiles. I'm going to quote you on that. Sure. How do we classify any animals then? Well, you can I don't start think you find by... I don't, think, I don't think you find any biologist with an IQ above five that would say birds are reptiles. You can believe that if you want. Birds are birds. Most can fly, some cannot. We got some emus here that can't fly. Ostriches can't fly. But they're flight flying birds. There are lots of different kinds of birds. And they are not reptiles. This crazy textbook here says animals, fungi, and plants are related. Do you believe whales are related to pine trees? That's what the kids are taught. This isn't science. This is propaganda. So you think reptiles, birds are reptiles. Don't teach my kids that. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, you can Google it for one thing, but it's the way that you classify animals. This is a, what Carlos, Lin Carlos Linnaeus uh, first tried to answer that question by starting with, the morphology or how animals look and, and organizing it by that. But then qu pretty quickly you find out that that's not specific enough and you have to get into the genetics. The genetic similarities between two populations of organisms are how scientists tell how closely related they are. Like dogs wow. and wolves have a lot of similarities in their, in their, <coughs> in their nucleotide sequence. Wow. Okay, just because they look similar doesn't mean they are related. They might have had the same designer. They used the same design over and over again. The Honda Accord and the Honda Prelude and the Honda Civic have a lot of similarities because Honda is designing and building all of them. So if there are some similarities, it does not prove common relationship. In your mind, it might, and you might be stuck in that rut, and that's the only way you can see it. But I think most folks say, wow, that must have had a common designer. We got two arms. Uh, a lot of animals have two arms and two legs. Uh, great. That's a great idea. Works good. Two eyes to get binocular vision. It doesn't prove any relationship. Why would you think that proves a relationship? We never see humans produce non-humans. But yet you believe humans came from, uh, there it is, an amoeba. Nope. What do we got here? Yep. Bacteria, amoeba. Th this chart is in, all the is in many of the textbooks. I got them right here beside me here. This isn't science. This is propaganda. The burden of proof is on you tonight. Where's the evidence for evolution? Where's the evidence of any animal or plant ever 
producing babies that were different than itself. And to say it happens too slowly to see, you're admitting there's no evidence. Well, there's no evidence of dogs giving birth to cats. I'll admit that because that's what you seem to think evolution is. Evolution doesn't suggest that an animal like a dog will give birth to something like a cat because of an evolutionary law called the law of monophyly. Animals are always going to be in the same category that every one of their ancestors was. That's okay, like I good. said, why a vertebrate is always going to produce a vertebrate. Well, hold it. Amoebas don't have backbones at all. Somewhere along the line, the single cell creatures without a backbone produced a backbone. So your law of monophyly, you're talking out of both sides of your face here. Which is it? Is the animal that never has a backbone like an amoeba or a single cell creature going to somehow produce one with a backbone now? Which is it, AJ? No, I, like I said, the very first single celled organisms were not amoeba. They were eukaryotic single celled organisms. And if you go down the line to humans, humans are still eukaryotes. So okay, just wait, like wait. every one of its ancestors was a eukaryote. Did that first single cell creature, whether it be amoeba or you, whatever you want to call it did, it, did it have a backbone? Did the single cell creature have a backbone? Did a single celled organism have a spine? Did no, the original... Kent, it didn't. The single celled organism didn't have a spine. Good. But you think it turned into a creature like us with a spine? No, I don't. Well, that's what I you just I don't think it said. turned into anything. It doesn't transform into a human. You seem to think that well, a single celled law... organism can magically shape shift into a full blown human. The law of monophyly says they stay within their same clade or whatever word you want to use. Well, the one without a backbone didn't stay there, did he? He grew a backbone somewhere over millions and billions of generations. So the law of monophyly, which is it? Do you believe the law of monophyly or do you believe in evolution? The law of monophyly is an evolutionary law. Not if the creature without a backbone grew a backbone. Okay, but you were, we're talking about giving birth. So an, a vertebrate is not going to give birth to an invertebrate. So did the invertebrate over millions of generations develop a backbone? What invertebrate? What, what you mean? The, 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 the original single cell creature was an invertebrate, didn't have a backbone. Now we have a backbone. So I said, nobody's ever seen any animal produce anything other than its kind. But somewhere along the line, that single cell creature without a backbone over millions of generations, slowly grew a back. What good is 1% of a backbone or half percent of a backbone? And where's the evidence for this? It's not science. You it have a religious belief. It didn't, it didn't give birth to an animal with a backbone, though, did it? Do you believe it gave birth to an animal that had 0.01% of a backbone? And then the next one, no. maybe five generations later, had 0.02%. Do you believe no, it slowly developed a backbone? You have a backbone, I'm assuming. So did you come from an invertebrate that didn't have a backbone? And if so, how did you get the backbone? I got it because of the DNA that my parents bestowed upon me from my mom and dad. They were vertebrates. So I too am a vertebrate because my mom gave birth to me. Correct. What about go back a thousand generations? Great, 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 great grandpa. Did they have a backbone? That's not what the law of monophyly talks about. It talks about one organism producing another organism giving birth. That's why I said you're conflating and you're doing it right now. You're conflating one animal giving birth to another, one generation, and millions of generations. Okay. I, simple question. Over millions, uh, over billions of generations, did the single celled creature, whatever kind it was, the invertebrate, slowly grow a backbone? If so, no. Where? <sighs> It didn't grow believe, a backbone. How many of you here can believe that is what he is saying or trying not to say? He does believe an invertebrate came to in, turned into a vertebrate over many generations. Isn't how, how did it happen? Is that what this chart is showing right here? How did it happen? How did we end up getting a backbone? Okay, so I guess I, I, I to be fair, I answered your question no because I'm talking about a single celled organism growing a backbone. But to be fair, yeah, okay. What I'm saying is that, yes, down the line, over a long of generations, you could say that a animal with a backbone came from one that didn't, but it didn't give birth to one in well, that, one generation. That's what okay, I'm saying. That violates your law of monophyly. No, they it doesn't. They will always be in their same clade. 
Yes, it does, AJ. You can't have it both ways. You don't even see that you're trying to talk out of both sides of your head. You don't even see it. You're blinded. I, I'm, I can't help you on that, but I think the audience can see it. This chart shows a single-celled creature, whatever kind you want it to be, an amoeba or bacteria or some kind of single-celled creature, slowly becoming everything. Humans, dinosaurs, birds, bears, it's all on the chart. My point is, this isn't science, but this is what is taught. And the purpose of this debate is for you to say, here's the evidence for why stuff like this should be taught. Where's the evidence for th this is evolution right here, the tree of life. Textbooks are full of them, and it's baloney. It's not science. I don't know if I can take questions from my audience or not, but uh, he does. What you're saying, does, wouldn't that mean that there hasn't been 10,000 single cells? Well, I, I, actually, I'm going to jump in, Kent. Let, Actually, let's just make sure it's between the debaters. Uh, AJ, sure. I noticed you wanted to share your screen. Was there another uh, line of evidence you now wanted to? We went back and forth on that one for about 12 minutes. Maybe we should uh, jump into another. Um, I, I can share your screen if that's what you wanted, AJ, or however you want to proceed. Go ahead, guys. Great discussion so far. Yeah, if that's okay, I'd like to talk about uh, kinds for just a second. Um, so... What is a kind? Let's find out. So Kent says that the definition of a kind is two animals that can interbreed. Bible says this 10 times in the first chapter and a dog cannot produce a non-dog because they would be a different kind like we just went over. But what about squirrels? So the Kaibab squirrel is separated by the Grand Canyon from the Abert squirrel. And these two squirrel populations, because evolution is about population genetics, have been separated long enough to where they cannot interbreed and produce fertile offspring anymore. It's not because of any physical limitations. They, their genetics will not allow them to interbreed if they tried. So I just have a few questions for Kent. Um, do you agree that animals can change over time? I think the animals can change wildly within limits. I think they're both still a squirrel and a four-year-old will tell you that. Now, whether they're interfertile or not for genetic reasons or biological reasons or mechanical reasons, there's all kinds of reasons creatures cannot be fertile. But that doesn't, they're still the same kind. Yes, the Abert squirrel and the uh, uh, Kaibab squirrel are still squirrels. Okay. Um, well, can this be caused by natural selection, this change? Nature can select which ones survive. That happens all the time. You turn all the dogs in the world loose in Alaska, the ones with short fur aren't going to survive. Your, nature is going to select the long haired dogs to survive in Alaska, it's not going to create long hair. It's going to select that part of the population. That's all it does. Natural selection selects. You want to give it creative power. I'm sorry. It doesn't create anything. It can only select. And it works fine. Yes, I believe in natural selection. Okay. Uh, well, and then can this produce animals that can't interbreed anymore? This process? I think that, yes. I think at the extremes of the kind, there might be some that can no longer interbreed. The Great Dane and the Chihuahua would have a difficult time, but they're still dog to a, a four-year-old will tell you that. And that is not evidence that the dogs, the Great Dane and the Chihuahua both came from a rock. Not evidence at all. You guys want to take that the examples like this, like the uh, squirrels and say, see, that proves we came from a rock, which is what your religion teaches. And that's not science. I got the Abert squirrel stuff right here. I'm looking for my slides. But, uh, so yes, I believe natural selection works just great. And it only selects doesn't create a thing. You want to give it creative power. Okay, so you do um, agree with me that one population of squirrels can, over time, because of variations, produce two populations of squirrels that can no longer interbreed. Would you agree that this same population, this new population, let's call this one the Kaibab squirrel on the left, do you think that this population can also produce two populations of squirrels that can no longer interbreed with each other? Possibly over generations that could happen. Now, did they come from two squirrels as parents? Every one of them yeah. came from parents that were two squirrels, no exceptions. Now, if they eventually get to the point where they can no longer interbreed, which happens, uh, that's still a squirrel. Uh, I think we see this happen all the time in just about every type of life form, whether it be potatoes or squirrels or pine trees, variations certainly happen. And sometimes they get pretty bizarre. Finally, I got it. Uh, 1396. Okay, 1396. That's what's happened with horses, for example. 
there are some yeah. that are no longer interfertile. You got itty bitty horses and great big horses, and they're still horses. So the Kaibab squirrel, the Abert squirrel, we've got uh, eight of them in our museum, I think, stuffed and mounted up here someone gave us. They're still squirrel. Now, whether they well, can interbreed or not, not after they're stuffed and mounted, they can't. But before that, they might have been able to. I don't know. Well, Kent, you know what this image reminds me of? The tree of life. Wait. So this same process oh. you just described is the same process that is described by hey, evolution. Wow. Back up one slide. Back up one slide. Okay. You have seven different kinds of squirrels. And so that reminds you that go now go one more, advance one more. So because you see seven kinds of squirrels, therefore, sunflowers are related to kangaroos. Do you believe sunflowers are related to kangaroos? Sure. I said okay. it reminds me of this image because of the shape of animals diversifying into other populations like the fish here. So this same process extrapolated over every living, living organism, that's what evolution is, is, is describing. So okay. my question would just be, where's the cutoff point where this is no longer science? Like let's the start with the fish. Is, the cutoff point is where they can no longer interbreed. <laughs> These squirrels that you showed all originally had a common ancestor called a squirrel. And if that's enough to you for you to believe that a squirrel and a sunflower are related, you need some real serious psychological help. I think we see a variety of owls. 225 owl species have now been identified. Okay, pretty impressive. Eight varieties of bears have now been identified. Okay, different kinds of fish. Okay, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage all came from an original mustard plant. They were mostly selectively bred by man, but they're still a plant. But you want to think, because of this variation we see, therefore, mustard plant is related to a whale. How can you not see you've gone bonkers on this, taking the little variations which are science and extrapolating in your mind to believe all this family tree stuff? I don't care that you believe that. I do care that you want to force that down the throats of all the kids. That I care about. Not science. Well, you also want to force your beliefs down the, the throats of kids, but and you admitted that. Um, but I, I'm curious. So you say that two animals are the same kind if they can interbreed, and yet these two squirrels that can't interbreed are the same kind because they had a common ancestor. I think anybody with IQ above five would say all the squirrels could have easily had a common ancestor. Now, have they diversified to where they can no longer interbreed? They're still the same kind. They're a squirrel. I think everybody will agree with that. You want to extrapolate that into thinking squirrels are related to watermelons, don't you? One topic at a time, Kent. Uh, Donnie, well, you, you, this, I'm this, done this, with my slides. Okay. This is the topic. Where is the border in your line? You said the law of monophyly, and yet a single-celled creature without a backbone, gradually, over trillions of generations, got a backbone. So do you believe the law of monophyly or not? Obviously you don't, but you don't even see that you don't. You got a backbone. The single cell creatures do not. So yes, well, variations happen and they are limited. Nobody's ever seen a watermelon produce a non-watermelon. You might get a big one or a little one. There's now 50 varieties. Most have probably been created by man for a particular purpose, but the God said they'll bring forth after their kind. There are what? Five, a thousand varieties of mangoes. Whoa. They bring forth after their kind. 7,500 varieties of apples. But the squirrels I agree. can't this bring apple. forth anymore. They can't what bring now? forth anymore. These two squirrel populations can't bring forth anymore. So how are they the same kind? Okay. Well, if that's enough for you to believe squirrels and watermelons are related, you need help. Okay. You're picking at a little tiny straw. They, they could originally bring forth. I think all seven of those kinds of squirrels you showed had a common ancestor, which was a squirrel. I don't think that's evidence that squirrels are related to pine trees. But so, they cannot interbreed with pine trees, that's for sure. And squirrels and apples cannot interbreed. Let's see, squirrels and mangoes can't. Squirrels and watermelon can't. So I think it's, it's obvious to a kindergartner that's the same kind. 
3,000 varieties of tomatoes. Wow. Might have had a common ancestor called a tomato. A thousand types of bananas. Might have had a common ancestor called a banana. <coughs> but you <coughs> wildly imagine that bananas and whales are related. You think you're related to a banana, don't you, AJ? No. Are you a, your chart you showed a minute ago of the family tree had a, bananas on there and humans with lines going back to a common ancestor? Okay, do you think you have a common ancestor with a banana? How's that? Bananas aren't living organisms. A banana bananas is the fruiting body of a banana plant. Hold it. Bananas aren't living organisms. No, a banana is the fruiting body of a banana plant or a banana tree. A banana by okay. itself is not a living organism that has relatives. So we're <laughs> okay. Let's try it again here. Um, let's take something simpler. Watermelon. Is watermelon a living organism? Sure. But a banana is not. Okay. The purpose of the debate tonight is for you to show scientific evidence for why you believe in evolution. Do you believe you and you you do believe you by your charts you showed that you are you have a common ancestor with a watermelon? Where's the scientific evidence for that? Squirrels producing squirrels that can no longer interbreed is that your best evidence? I didn't say that was evidence. That was me examining your own claim about kinds, which apparently is so easy to understand, even though your definition has no consistency. So I didn't say that that was evidence that squirrel is related to any other animal. I was well, talking definition, about... Okay, your definition of monophyly doesn't make any sense either then, because an animal without a backbone produced a backbone, didn't it? No. It didn't? No. Over millions the, of generations. It slowly produced a backbone. Sure. Okay. That's not science. That's a religious uh, belief. Wh wh why do you get to decide what is and isn't science? Oh, I'd rather have me decide it than you. Why do you get well, to I, decide what is science? I don't Who gave claim, you this authority? I don't claim to have that authority. Why do you? I'm, I'm going by the definition of science for the last hundreds of years. Well, we can acknowledge <coughs> the word science comes from the Latin word seer, which means to know. What do we know? We know squirrels produce squirrels. We know that. We do not know that squirrels and watermelons have a common ancestor. You can believe that. So science is knowledge. And look it up in dictionaries for the last 500 years. Knowledge gained by observation, experimentation, and testing. You'll tell you what. You can test it all you want. Get your squirrels, test them all you want in the laboratory, turn them into anything that anybody would consider a non-squirrel. Could you turn the squirrel into an oak tree or a watermelon or a human? Or is it always going to be a squirrel? Well, what about uh, squirrels and chipmunks? Are they related? You didn't answer the question, but okay. I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt squirrels and chipmunks. They have a lot of design similarities. Same God made them all. But that doesn't prove they had a common ancestor. We've never seen squirrels and chipmunks interbreed. We see squirrels and squirrels interbreed. We got them in our trees by the hundreds around here. Uh, so, yeah, I think squirrels can make baby squirrels and nothing else. Chipmunks. Okay, well, well uh, man has been, about... might have been, some humans might have decided to put chipmunks and squirrels in the same family. We've divided animals up, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I don't think the squirrels care how we organize them. They don't care at all. They don't even think about it. We've decided squirrels and chipmunks are in the same family. Okay. Squirrel doesn't care that. Are they the same kind? No. Why is the kind any less arbitrary? Because God said it? God said 20 times in the first seven chapters, they will bring forth after their kind. I've chosen to believe that. That's all we've ever observed. I think that's science, but I'm not demanding that be taught. Yes, you are. I am? Okay. <laughs> you admitted it. And the Bible also says to stone homosexuals. Do you think that we should do that? The Bible says to stone homosexuals? Yeah. Is that the topic you want to get on now? Well, Donnie, you're, the one that yeah, brought, you're the one that brought up what God said. So I was just wondering oh. if, if well, you're God consistent said, with God that. Well, God said quite a few things. We could bring that up if you'd like. But... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's stick to the evolution. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Fair enough. I know why Kent would want to avoid that. 
Well, certainly homosexuals don't bring forth at all, if you know how it works. Okay, I've been married a long time. I, I know how it works. I taught biology and anatomy. Got it figured out really well. Okay, so they don't bring forth at all, but that's a different topic. We only have a debate on that if you'd like. But no, I don't think we should stone them. I think they should give their heart to the Lord and get saved. God can save them. Now, they may have hardened their heart where they don't want to be saved anymore. Okay. So back to the topic, though. Mangoes, apples, wasps, tomatoes, bananas, always bring forth after their kind. Yeah, you guys want to have these charts taught to the kids that animals and plants have a common ancestor. Where is the evidence of any animal ever producing something that would not be considered an animal? You want to connect animals and plants back to bacteria. This there, isn't science. There's no evidence of an animal giving birth to a plant. But there is evidence of common ancestry, and that's the DNA. So the fact that they have plants and animals, some have similar DNA, is evidence they're related. Could it be evidence they have a common designer? Could it be evidence that God designed the plants so the animals could eat them and digest them? If they were too radically different, the brown cow couldn't eat the green grass and give the white milk and churn it and get the yellow butter, and I eat it and get the blonde hair. I think it's an amazing network of all kinds of things work together. So sure, there are similarities in DNA, similarities in cell structure. So otherwise, we could only eat each other. Why is that? It's not that way. It's designed so that brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk. I think that's pretty cool. Are there similarities in DNA between the milk and the grass? Maybe so. Probably because they're designed to work together. But you guys, we see, you see similarities and immediately conclude common ancestor. That's not common sense, let alone science. If I see similarities in two different books, I read different books by Shakespeare, and I see similarities between Macbeth and, you know, Romeo and Juliet, okay? Okay, so I see similarities. What's that mean? The same guy wrote the book. That's what it means. If we see similar DNA from a squirrel and a bat, it doesn't prove a common ancestor. The same guy wrote the code. The code to any living creature, any living creature's DNA code is more complex than the space shuttle. A single-celled amoeba, the DNA structure of an, one single cell is more complicated than the space shuttle. And you think it happened by chance with no designer. I feel sorry for you if you want to live that way, but that's not science. That's my whole point. All so, the leopards might have had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue with that. Hybrid cats, they can crossbreed. Let's see, they can crossbreed jaguars and lions and get a jag lion. Wow, because they're still in the cat family. You can't crossbreed a jaguar with a pine tree. That I'd guarantee, or a watermelon or a bat. So they get all kinds of crossbreeding within the cat kind. Where exactly is the border in the biblical cat of kind? I don't know. I'm not asking that to be taught. Yes, but you, you guys are. see these varieties and say, see, that proves oak trees are related to tigers. That is, is, it, is real it my turn stupid, finally? And I wish you could see it. Go ahead. So you have a son, Kent Andrew, and a daughter, Marlissa. They have DNA similarities in the sequence of their genetic code. Is that proof that they have a common ancestor? Oh, yeah. Both of them have a common ancestor with their mother and I, and probably with grandma and great grandma. I bet it goes back for hundreds of generations, and they were all human, every one of them. Doesn't go back to an amoeba, though, like you believe, or a single cell creature, an invertebrate. It's so DNA similarities prove common ancestry. DNA similarities can be proven, <coughs> can give us a lot, of <coughs> a lot of evidence for a lot of different things. I think it's limited at some point. And like I said, if there are similarities in the DNA of the grass and the cow, maybe that's so the cow can eat the grass. If they were too wildly different, they couldn't digest it. We can't eat and digest rocks. That's pretty, pretty obvious. So... I don't think the DNA of a rock exists at all. But if it's got DNA, which is a really complicated, I think that's indication. Somebody really smart wrote that code. The DNA code, you take the simplest life form you can think of, a single celled anything, bacteria, eukaryote, it had a really complex DNA, more complex than the space shuttle. So if you wish to believe it happened by chance, that's great. That's not science. I wish you'd keep your religion home and not in our school system. Um, what, what do you mean when you say by chance, just that a God didn't do it? We don't ever see complex things happen by chance, just random yes, chance. We do. 
Yeah, we do. You do. You think you think the DNA code could evolve, could develop itself over millions of generations, and all the uh, parts of the DNA could be lined up, and the uh, helical uh, chromosomes could work, and they could learn to divide themselves with mitosis or meiosis. You think all that really happened with no designer involved? You really believe that? Well, that wasn't the, the question. The question was, can complex things happen because of chance? I mean, if you've ever heard of the butterfly effect, something like a hurricane can is extremely complex and it can be caused by a chance happening. Natural disasters can be caused by chance. If you have a system that's very simple, but you give it rules that are very rigid and eventually that complex, that simple system will become very complex. This is what happens in nature. So a butterfly flapping his wings could cause a hurricane over someplace else. <laughs> well, I don't think that that's literally what it means, but that's the idea. Yeah, I understand the butterfly effect. And I think that this is not a living organism. The hurricane isn't. And the wing flapping is not moving a living organism, it's just moving air. So if you want to take the DNA code of a bat, which is really complicated, it's always going to produce a baby bat. Now, there's 1,100 different species of bats have been identified. They're still bat. Nobody's seen them never produce a non-bat. But you wish to imagine, and that's why I say all you have is imagine over millions of generations. Just imagine. No, I want to see it. I want science. Your imagination evolution is not science. The whole purpose of this debate series is where's the evidence for evolution? You say, well, over you can't see the mountains growing. Yeah, I agree. And you can't see it gradually change from a single cell creature to a vertebrate. I agree. So Where it's not science. Where do we get to see this? Where do we see it? So geology isn't science then, by your definition? Geology is one branch of science. Evolution has nothing to do with that. Biology is another wonderful branch of science. I taught it for 15 years. But evolution has nothing to do with biology. Bio means life. Ology means study of the study of living things. All we've studied and said, wow, there's a lot of different kinds of bats. They might have had a common ancestor, which was a bat. That's science. But you want to draw a chart saying the bat is related to the pine tree. That's not science. And I can't get you to see it. At least I can't get you to admit it. I think tonight you're starting to see it a little bit, and it bothers you. Because if I'm right, and there's a God who created these things, you may have to answer to him for some things. I'd like to get you ready for that. I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. But I got a Savior to save me. Praise God. And he loves you and wants to save you. If you don't want him, okay. But he, he, available, the offer is available. The Bible says yeah, the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood and the coming judgment of God. Second Peter chapter 3. I got to put your name in the margin of my Bible right there. Second Peter chapter 3. Because you're one of the yeah. scoffers. You're scoffing. And you're willingly ignorant of the creation. You just don't want to see... It's so complicated, had to be a God, make it. Okay, believe what you want, but it's not science. You have no scientific evidence of any animal or plant ever producing anything that any four-year-old would consider a different kind. Do you have a textbook that says that evolution says that dogs give birth to things that aren't dogs like cats? I can show you the charts from the textbook that say dogs came from something that wasn't dog. But that's but not giving birth. No, you you see no. here you are. You're trying to hide. You, dogs always give birth to dogs. That's the law of monophyly. But the dog came from something that was non-dog long ago and far away, didn't it? So that's you don't have it. You don't have a textbook that's that says that evolution suggests that animals give birth to something that is not the same species. Fourteen seventy. No, I've never said that. This one you, has you've said dogs. it multiple times in this debate. Okay. Top one o'clock on this chart here is a canine, the canine, canine family. This chart taught in public school textbooks is showing the canine is related to the human on the bottom at uh, say nine, eight thirty on the on the thing here. And let's see, we have the kangaroo or marsupials at about nine thirty, ten o'clock. So, do you believe dogs, kangaroos, and humans? go back to a common ancestor like this chart shows. Dogs always produce dogs going forward, but apparently going backwards didn't work, did it? They came from something that was non-dog. 
Well, there's no, there's not a reverse process of giving birth. So I don't know, but I would answer yes to that question. Yes. Animals have common ancestry. That's what evolution says. It doesn't say anything about dogs giving birth to cats. I didn't but say that either. Yes. You, saying, you said it multiple chart, times in this debate. This chart has lines on the paper showing the dog and the cat having a common ancestor. Do you believe the dog and the cat had a common ancestor, AJ? Yes. Okay. Why do you believe that? Where's the evidence for that? The DNA, because the DNA, they have DNA similarities. That proves because common ancestry like you admitted earlier. So because there are DNA similarities, the only thing you can see is they got to have a common ancestor. But we don't ever see this happen. You can't even see that maybe they got the same designer. It's a pretty complex code. The DNA code of a cat and the DNA code of a dog might have a lot of similarities. They might have DNA code to tell them how to grow hair. I bet they do. And there might be cut, copy and paste. I think Microsoft PowerPoint and Microsoft Word have thousands of identical lines of code. I bet if I'm in PowerPoint and I click spell check, it takes me to the same dictionary as when I'm in Microsoft Word and I click spell check. Identical lines of code, whole dictionary. That doesn't prove they evolved. The same guys wrote the code. So if a dog and a cat both have a DNA code that tells them how to make hair and how to put a tail on the back and the nose on the front, that wouldn't prove a common ancestor. I think it proves some same designer wrote the code. This, this one has the dolphin at about three o'clock. Dolphin related to the horse and the bat and the elephant. This, my whole point is, this isn't science. This is propaganda. This is lying to the kids. They're claiming they've got evidence for this when we don't. We never see a dog produce a non-dog, but they think a dog came from some, the same ancestor as a, as a whale. I think that's propaganda. That's my whole point. I accept the facts that cows can be trained to jump. They have rodeos where they jump cows. Okay? Therefore, if you make your cow work out, go to the gym, take a lot of vitamins, you can eventually get your cow to jump over the moon. This is what you believe, AJ. We see these little changes, therefore, everything's related. No, I bet there's a limit how high cows can jump. And I bet there's a limit to how far dogs can change. And I bet there's a limit to how far squirrels can change. What is you that limit? Kind of where they're no longer interfertile. Kaibab squirrel, Abert squirrel, I don't know that they're interfertile for biological reasons. I know for you know geographical reasons they are. But so what? It's still a squirrel. So the cow can jump higher and higher. Therefore, someday it'll jump over the moon. This is what you believe, that these changes are unlimited. And what this is, is where limit? you're crazy. The What's changes the are obviously limited biologically. All of us, science, science is what we can observe and study and test. That's why my hammer, when I whack an atheist, science means knowledge. That's what the word means. Look it up. Latin word seer, to know. What do we know? We know there are limits to how high a cow can jump. Has they, have they reached that limit in the rodeo? I don't know. They might get one to jump a little higher next year, but they're never going to get one to jump over the moon. Have we reached the limit in dog size? Great Dane, Chihuahua, has that, have they reached the limit? Eh, probably getting close. They're never going to get a dog as big as Texas. I guarantee that. They're never going to get a dog as small as a flea. So have they reached the limit? I don't know. And actually, I don't care. But I think there is a limit. That's the whole point. You guys don't see the. There's a limit to all of these changes. There's 1,100. What is that limit? All the different varieties of watermelons. Is there a limit? You think they'll ever get a watermelon as big as Texas? What is the no. limit? What now? What is the limit that stops a dog from changing? What we all we've observed is you get bigger dogs or smaller dogs through selective breeding, most of which would not survive in the wild by themselves. But okay, there's a limit somewhere. And have we reached the limit? Have they reached the limit in the 100 yard dash for man running 100 yard dash? I don't know, somebody may break the record someday, but it'll be by a hundredth of a second. I think they're getting close to the limit in most things in sports. They're never gonna get somebody to throw a baseball 10 miles. They might have somebody throw one, you know, from left field to home plate and, and no bounce. That's a long throw. But are they ever going to throw one from Texas to California? No, I don't think they'll do that. There are limits to all these things, and you don't see it. You don't want to see well, it. Well, I can't see it because you can't tell me what the limit is for oh, dogs changing. Okay. So because I can't tell you what the limit is for how high a cow can jump, 
Therefore, it's not what I said. You think a cow could jump over the moon? Okay, it's Second Peter said. chapter three. The scoffers who are willingly ignorant. Here we go. AJ, you just made it into God's word. Go ahead. What's your next point? Actually, before um, you do ask, AJ, and, and I don't want to, um, no, you know, go this ahead. It's a fast paced discussion that uh, I do want to inform you, gentlemen, that we do have, you know, we've had almost 400 people in the live chat. So we do have quite a few audience questions. Did we want to jump into maybe three minute? Uh, okay. Okay, let's do this in order to be fair in case, you know, maybe AJ, there's a couple points you wanted to make sure you got in there. Same with you, Kent. Let's do three minute uh, closings, if that's okay. Uh, three to five minutes, whatever you need there. And then we'll get into some audience questions. So uh, that was over an hour of open discussion. So great job, gentlemen. And AJ, why don't we start with you? Three to five minutes. And then uh, same for Kent. And we'll get into some questions. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Donnie. And I want to say thank you to Kent for uh, doing this debate. I know we unfortunately had to reschedule uh, last time because Kent wasn't feeling good. And I could tell that he's coughing a lot. So I appreciate Kent for sticking it out for the whole debate, seriously. Um, and I told Donnie that I would rather face Kent when he's at 100% than do like a half a debate with him. So I, I do pre appreciate that fact. Um, although. I don't think that Kent was able to answer some of my questions about what the limits are for dogs changing. You know, if a dog can only get as big as a Great Dane, what is the limit that stops it? He seems to be suggesting that it's something to do with physics, like the gravity will be too, you know, too strong for a dog to get bigger than that because its legs wouldn't be able to support its weight. I can understand a limit like that, but genetically, I don't see a limit to, you know, that suggested that we couldn't have a dog bigger than a Great Dane. That doesn't mean I think that we can have a dog as big as Texas because that's obviously ridiculous. Now, Kent was really talking out of both sides of his mouth, even though he accused me of that, of saying that he's not trying to get creationism taught in public schools when I show that he is. And he said it multiple times. In fact, he seems to relish the idea of putting his materials into the public schools he, because he's got a vendetta against evolution, even though he doesn't pay for it because he uh, operates a 501c3 nonprofit organization that does not pay property taxes. And yet he complains about having to pay property taxes and pay taxes to go to ev teaching evolution public schools. It seems kind of hypocritical. but. Evolution is pretty simple. It's not as complicated as Kent makes it out to be. It's just microevolution, which is variation between species. You take that process and extrapolate it out. Small changes over time can lead to big changes, i.e. macroevolution or variation between species, which is speciation, just like Kent admitted happens with squirrel populations. You can have squirrels that, oh, sorry. You can have squirrels that, get variations and changes over time, and then eventually they become so different that they can no longer interbreed. Well, that prop, and he says they're the same kind, even though they can't interbreed because they had a common ancestor. That's evolution. Flat out, that is evolution. Not what Kent's describing, this other ridiculous process that he says that a dog will give birth to a cat or a bottle of shampoo. That's not what evolution says. And he seems to be intentionally conflating these two things on purpose. So it was a good debate. And thank you to Donnie for hosting it. That's all for me. Okay, Atheist Junior, thank you so much. That was three minutes on the dot. And uh, Kent, we're going to give you the same amount of time, three to five minutes. Then we'll get into some audience questions. Kent, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Sure. I think there are limits on dog size. I think they might have reached it with the Great Dane, but there are animals bigger than that, like an elephant. You think I'll ever get a dog as big as an elephant? Let's forget Texas. No, they're never going to get one as big as an elephant, but there are animals that big. So the Bible says very clearly 20 times in the first seven chapters, they will bring forth after their kind, after his kind, after his kind. Charlie Darwin wrote a book, The Origin of Species. Well, that's not the argument. A dog and a wolf are different species, but they're the same kind of animal. So there are six meanings to this word evolution, in spite of what AJ and others would like us here to believe. 
There is no evidence whatsoever for cosmic evolution, a big bang. There's no evidence that time, space, and matter could create itself, which is what evolution has. Where did time come from? If the universe began 13.772 billion years ago, what was here 13.773 billion years ago? Where did time come from? Where did space come from? Where did matter come from? This is essential to have a coherent theory. Then you have to have the chemicals evolve. <laughs> we talked about that. <coughs> the Big Bang would produce hydrogen. Well, how do you get gold from hydrogen? I'd like to learn that one. Then you have to have the stars evolving. Nobody's ever seen a star form or a planet form. And you have to have life get started from non-living material. At least, AJ, you guys could start with number four. How do you get living organisms from non-living material? Where is the scientific evidence? You can't even make it happen in the laboratory. And if they could make life in the laboratory, that would prove it takes intelligence to make life. Duh. That would prove creation, not evolution. Nobody's ever seen number five, macroevolution. Nobody's ever seen an animal produce a different kind of animal. Even slowly, like the uh, you carry, like the uh, single-cell creatures they do in the laboratory, uh, with thousands of generations observed by one lifetime, one observer can watch tens of thousands of generations of single-cell creatures replicate, replicate, replicate. That's all they ever get: single-cell creature, same kind. That's all they ever get. It's not science to say that that single-cell creature slowly grew a backbone and turned to an elephant. Microevolution is a lousy word. We shouldn't use it, but they do. It's a variation within the same kind. Now, that one is science. The first five are pure religion. So I stand my ground. Variations happen within the kind, but that's not really evolution. They shouldn't call it microevolution. They should call it a variety. That's all it is. That's all we've ever seen. You guys believe that humans and birds and reptiles and ladybugs have a common ancestor. Oh, and, and pine trees and worms. This is propaganda. This isn't science. Wish they'd quit teaching it. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Kent. That was three minutes for your concluding statement. Uh, gentlemen, definitely a, uh, a debate to remember. So tons of fun in the free-flowing discussion style format. All right, let's get to uh, some of these 1,000 questions that have come in. And uh, we will start with, we've got a solid mix of questions for AJ and Kent. As you both know, I believe, uh, you know, you both can have responses to each question. We'll just make sure the, uh, the, qu the person who got the question gets the final word. So here we go. First question comes in from Luca Medugno. This one is uh, for you, Kent. And Luca asks, can you give an example of evolution that you would accept? Of course just a hypothetical one he says sure i accept the idea that mac microevolution happens i accept the idea that probably uh the varieties of let's take humans there are dark-skinned humans and light-skinned humans i believe they're they probably had a common ancestor called a human that's as far as it goes i think there are probably 20 different varieties of horses and zebras that might have had a common ancestor it had, it had four hooves and four legs and tail on the back and nose on the front and recognizable as uh, equus. So I think variations within what I would consider the same kind are obvious and they happen all the time. There's 115 different varieties of pine trees. Might have had a common ancestor called a pine tree. That is microevolution, if you wanna use that word, I accept that. That's as far as it goes, there's no evidence it goes beyond that, okay? Thank you, Kent. Uh, AJ, go ahead if you had a response. Um. Well, an example of evolution, uh, I would say Darwin's finches was the first uh, notable example of evolution or the, the big one. And when Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that finches that had been blown to different islands because of hurricane or, you know, strong winds had small changes based on, they had different beak size based on the environment that they lived in. So that would be my example. Thank you, AJ. Kent, you get the final word if you wanted it. I covered that very carefully in my video number four of my series about Darwin's observations. He found 14 varieties of finches on the islands. They had a common ancestor called a finch. They had different beak shapes because of the food supply on that island. Some islands only had 
nuts to crack that were hard to crack. And so the heavy beaks survived. Skinny beak didn't survive. Didn't create the beak, didn't create the heavy beak. It didn't give them a jackhammer or a, a pliers. It only selected those with a heavy beak to survive. That's all they did. Natural selection works great. Darwin discovered natural selection. I agree. Good observation, Charlie. But then he went to the wild conclusion that the finches are related to the pine trees and the, and the elephants and the whales. This is so stupid. Okay. 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 Thank you for that. Luca, thanks for the uh, responses, AJ and Ken. Okay. $5 super chat comes in from James W. James, appreciate it. He was just here last night for our double header debate night, and he will be here next month debating Kent again as well. So a uh, question is there for, for you, Ken. He asks, what mechanism enforces the limit in microevolution? How does an organism stay the same kind when it keeps accumulating mutations? All the mutations that have ever been observed are harmful or fatal or neutral. We have ducks on our pond here that flew in and they got some feathers sticking out the side of their head because the skull didn't grow right. So it's a mutation. Nobody's ever seen a beneficial mutation that could take over the population. So what mechanism enforces, I think, the, the DNA replication process, uh, reproduction enforces, there's going to be a limit. You cross two cows, you're going to get a cow every time. No exceptions. You crossbreed two ducks, you're going to get a duck every time. There are no exceptions. So there are genetic limits. There are obvious uh, physical limits. Okay, you're not going to get a dog as big as Texas. Uh, there are, uh, see, science is what we can observe. We observe, hey, there's limits. How fast can a horse run? Have they reached the limit? I don't know. Secretariat was pretty fast. Have they beaten that record yet? Maybe not. Might by a second or two. But it, there's a limit. Physical limits, biological limits. I think it's obvious. It's limited in the DNA code. So what enforces it? I think that God must have designed it that way to work that way. But I don't know. I'm not enforcing it. But I know when I had children, they turned out to be human every time. Go ahead, AJ. Well, um, since there is no such thing as a kind, there is no limit. There is no mechanism. And um, I don't think that Kent can really answer this question because I was trying to ask him the same question or a similar question about what, what are the limits that stop us from getting a dog bigger than a Great Dane. But DNA replication errors... I don't see how that will stop an animal from becoming a different kind because the definition of kind is whatever Kent wants it to be. Thank you, AJ. Kent, if you want, you get the okay. final word. So for the record, he just said DNA replication errors uh, make there's no limit. I think that's crazy. It's not science. <clears throat> to draw a chart like this, it says birds and humans and ladybugs have a common ancestor is not science. Where are the limits? Uh, mutations happen. I don't know that they accumulate very far because you get too many mutations, the creature dies or can't, reap or can't live at all. All mutations observed are harmful or fatal. Maybe when we debate James, James, show me the best mutation you know that adds information. All the, all the mutations scramble existing information. They don't add any information. They scramble what's already existing. Where's the mutation that adds new information? I'd like to see that. I don't think there's any. I defy you to show me some. Okay, thank you for the responses, uh, debaters, and also James. Thanks for your question. Okay, so next one um, comes in from, let's see here. Got a solid mix, but I don't want to pick questions that we've, we've already kind of answered. Um, okay, here's one. Uh, Snake was right. So $5 super chat. Thank you so much. And uh, Snake and Kent debated last night. So here we go. He asked. Good debate. Good debate. That was. So he's asking you, uh, Kent. And he says, um, for Kent, birds are reptiles and dinosaurs by definition, whether related or not. Do you agree dogs and whales are both mammals? Well, uh, Taylor, your first statement, birds are reptiles and dinosaurs by definition. This is propaganda. This is not science. Birds are not reptiles. Birds are not dinosaurs. Birds are birds, okay? Ask your mama, she can explain it to you. The fact that you make a statement like that doesn't make it true. This is propaganda. This is not science. Birds make baby birds every time, without exception. 
You got an example, an exception to that? I'd like to see it. So for you to just make a statement like that, that's like me saying, well, elephants can fly. No, they can't. You can't fly. And birds are not reptiles. I'm sorry, they're not. So you're dreaming. Your premise is totally wrong. So your question's invalid. It's like me asking you, why are elephants orange? They're not orange, okay? The question's invalid. Your statement starts off with something real stupid. Birds are not reptiles. Real stupid. Believe that if you want, but that's not science. Go ahead. Appreciate it, Kent. AJ, anything you'd like to add? Well, I think we have another question that Kent didn't answer because the oh, question okay. was about are, are dogs and whales both mammals? Oh, so, yeah. Dogs, do, man has decided to classify animals that breathe air, that are warm blooded, that produce live young as mammals. I don't think the dog cares that we put him in the same category as the whale. I don't think he even thinks about it. But yes, man has decided our careless lineage classification system in 1700s divided it up, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Man has arbitrarily decided to arrange things in categories. That's great. It's wonderful. No, I'm not against that. That's changed over the years many, many times and probably going to change again. Some animals move from one species to a different kind or a different variety or a different uh, subspecies. But yes, man has decided dogs and whales are both mammals. That does not mean birds are reptiles. Totally unrelated. Go ahead. So man has decided that uh, dogs and whales are both mammals, and you say that that's valid, but man has also decided that reptiles are vertebrates that have scales on, part, on at least one part of their body and lay eggs, but that doesn't include birds as reptiles. That's invalid. Seems like a double standard to me. Birds lay a calcium-covered egg. Reptiles lay a leathery-type egg. The reproductive system is very different. The number of DNA chromosomes is very different in these creatures. If you wish to believe birds are reptiles, I got some property I want to sell you in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Beautiful. All right, here we go. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for the interesting back and forth as always. So uh, another super chat comes in, this one from SWE, appreciate it. And again, this one is, is for you, Kent. So she asks, how does Kent explain the tetra tetrapod forelimbs, for example, like in whales, frogs, bats, etc., all having the same pattern. A single bone is followed by a pair of long bones, which are linked to the hand with digits. Go ahead. I explain it like that is an amazing design. You got the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, the carpals, the metacarpals, the phalanges. I think it works amazing. I like mine. I use them all the time. Broke them several times, but they healed up. That's a good question about the healing process. So a lot of animals seem to have this same pattern because they function, they do the same thing. I think a lot of vehicles have a drive shaft to get the engine, to get the power from the engine to the back wheels somehow, either through a spinning shaft or through a chain in the early days. So I think that there's an amazing design that so many animals have a similar design in the forelimb. That's not evidence of a common ancestor. That's amazing design. So the question was, how does Kent explain it? God created it and I love it. It's amazing. Okay. Thank you, Kent. SWE, thank you for the super chat. AJ, if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah. I mean, you spent $10 to ask that. Of course, he's just going to say that God did it. But the reason is that they're a homologous structure. And it's uh, I, what's really interesting is why do whales have bones inside their flippers? Why do they have what appear to be finger bones instead of, I don't know, just a solid plate? Maybe it's because they share a homology and they share common ancestry with these animals that had tetrapod forelimbs. And that's why they have the same pattern of bones or that they even have what appear to be finger bones at all inside their flipper. It doesn't really make sense to me as a design. <coughs> Doesn't make sense to you, but the reason the whales have bones, the whales not only just paddle with their flippers, they can maneuver them and contour them to give more thrust to one side or the other and to swim. They actually can move around different directions while they swim. They can decide to surface or submerge. So the fact that they can have flexibility within their flipper, I think is amazing design. Homologous structures. Here we go. Uh, there we go. There they are. Just went right to it. Slide number 1619. Alt-DV, 1619. Enter. Okay. I agree. There are four limbs of different animals that have similarities. I agree. 
there's not, it's not proof of a common ancestor though. It could be proof of a common designer and a design that works really well. Simple enough. But you guys refuse to see the obvious, hey, there's two choices here. Maybe it's designed to be this way or maybe it just happened this way. You can believe whatever you want. My point would be that real science would say, we don't know, we couldn't prove either one. But you guys want your religion only, talk to the kids. I resent that. Okay, thank you so much. Another one comes in from Snake Was Right. So uh, $5 Super Chat, thank you so much. And he's asking again for you, Kent, how do you know all squirrels had a common ancestor? What would be your method of comparison? First place, I don't know that. I haven't watched them reproduce all of them. We got a bunch of them doing around here all the time. So I suspect that's true. But again, I'm not demanding mine to be taught. Uh, they want us to they want uh, us to all teach that squirrels and pine trees have a common ancestor. How do you know squirrels and pine trees have a common ancestor? I think it's logic 101 to say, sure, all the squirrels could have come from a squirrel. It's not logic to say all the squirrels could have come from a pine tree. But you got these lines, lines on paper connecting plants and animals to a common ancestor. That's propaganda. Thank you, Kent. Uh, AJ, go ahead. Well, uh, Kent is trying to get his uh, creation material taught in public schools. I've established <laughs> that, and he's he admitted stopped. that. Well, you're the one that brought it up. I, I yeah. thought that science was what we know. So if you don't know this, then I guess it's not science that all squirrels had a common ancestor. Is it science that squirrels and pine trees have a common ancestor? Yes, it is. OK. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right, uh, gents, we got one now for you, AJ, a super chat. So again, ahead of time, I do want to let the audience know that, um, you know, we, we, we've gone a bit longer on this debate. So apologies ahead of time if we don't get to your question. Of course, we can't be here all night. So here's one for you, AJ, Boomer21. And he asks, <laughs> question for Atheist Jr. If the dinos, the dinosaurs are over 60 million years old, how do you account for the ongoing discoveries of soft tissue in their bones and fossil? Well, I, I assume that he's talking about the... Uh, Dyn the soft tissue that Mary Schweitzer discovered within uh, T-Rex bone. And that's not blood, like liquid blood that, that was discovered. What she found was evidence of blood, the iron and hemoglobin. And the reason that it had lasted so long was similar to the same way that leather is produced things in inside the molecules, the iron wraps around these molecules and is able to produce uh, to, uh, I forget the word, to save some of these parts of the blood vessel. But you don't find dinosaur fossils and you crack it open and it's got liquid blood in it. There's remnants that have been preserved. That was the word I was looking for. I couldn't think of it. But I don't think you can find soft tissue like you can't f dig up a uh, a dinosaur fossil and find like a kidney in it. So I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about, about ongoing discoveries of soft tissue, but uh, that would be my answer. Hey, thank you, AJ. Uh, Kent, anything you'd like to add? Oh, yes. Many examples have been found of soft tissue in dinosaur bones. Uh, it's not just Mary Schweitzer's. It's been many since then, okay? Uh, they tend to get not published very well because they go so much against the theory. But I think, how would I explain it? All the dinosaurs that drowned in the flood in the days of Noah 4,400 years ago, many turned to fossils, some rotted, some turned to oil. But uh, some we find, the fact that we find fossils at all is indication of rapid burial. Animals die today by the millions and nobody, they don't, none of them fossilized. So yes, you are simply mistaken, AJ. There have been many examples found of soft tissue in dinosaur bone. And I explain it very simply. They're not millions of years old. The 60 million years is pure baloney, not true. The world's 6,000 years old. It was destroyed by a flood about 4,400 years ago. And so some of the animals that were buried turned to stone. Some didn't quite finish fossilizing yet. No problem for me at all. Thank you, Kent. AJ, question was for you. Get the last word. Okay, so 
when a large animal dies and blood begins to decompose, iron is released from the hemoglobin. And as it seeps out into the tissues and bones in high concentration, it initiates something that's called cross-linking. And cross-linked proteins are what's used in forming leather because it preserves the tissue. So soft tissues are preserved sort of like leather. This is why these soft tissue are able to last so long. But like I said, you're, you're not going to find uh, soft tissue or, or bodily fluids that look like they're from a week ago. They're going to be part of a fossil. So they are extremely old, but it could still be, you know, soft tissue is a little bit of a, a misleading term. Okay, thank you, AJ. Uh, next question is another super chat from Snake Was Right. Appreciate it, ten dollars, and uh, for you again, Kent. So it looks like we're having another debate between you and Snake here. Appreciate these questions, keeping it fun. So he asks, uh, well, he says single cell eukaryotes have been observed to produce multicellular eukaryotes. Doesn't break the law of monophyly since eukaryote isn't defined by being unicellular. Any thoughts, Kent? I'd like to see the evidence for that. I'd be glad to study. Is he talking about a two-celled creature or a colony of cells working together? Single-celled creatures coming together to make a colony is not the same as a multi-celled creature. Appreciate it, Kent. Uh, AJ, any response? Well, I mean, all humans start out as a single cell and become multicellular eukaryotes, although I'm not sure if that's what that person means. Now, um, there are examples of algae, like we talked about in, in the last debate I did with Kent, that were observed to produce or to become multicellular. And the reason that this grouping of cells is not a colony is because in a colony, any cell can break off from the group and live on its own. But in a living organism, all of the cells have different functions. And so if it breaks off, it'll die. That's the difference between a multicellular organism and simply a colony of single cells that come together. Okay, appreciate it, AJ. Kent, uh, you get the last word, brother. Question was for you. Well, humans can work together. I, got, I work together with people all the time, but we don't become one. We're it's a group of people. It's a colony. Uh, so that's all that's ever been observed. Nobody's ever observed a two-celled creature or three-celled. But somewhere along the line, it had to go from single cell to 100 trillion cells like a human today. Somewhere along the line, something happened in their theory that they cannot prove. That's why evolution is a religion. Nothing scientific about it. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, again, this has been a ton of fun. Very engaging debate. Well worth the wait. Time has flown by, so we're going to wrap it up here with one or two more questions. And uh, AJ, this one is for you. This one comes in from Taylor K. I do appreciate the question, Taylor. And she asks, question for AJ. Do you believe all of the symbiotic relationships pr present in the world and required to sustain life all occurred by random chance? Well, if... If by random chance you mean just that means God didn't do it, then yes, I do believe that. But if you say that God is the one who created all these symbiotic relationships, then you also have to accept the fact that God would have created every parasitic relationship, like parasitic wasps that lay their eggs inside of a caterpillar. And then when those eggs hatch, they eat their way out of the caterpillar, killing it. So I guess God created parasitic relationships too. Okay, thank you for that answer. AJ, uh, Kent, anything you'd like to add? I think there are probably billions of examples of symbiotic relationships in nature. Classic one, plants breathe in CO2 and give off oxygen, which we need. We breathe in oxygen and give off CO2, which is what they need. So plants and animals have a completely symbiotic relationship as far as reciprocation of the gases go, as well as hundreds of other things. I think you'll find millions of animals require certain plants, and some plants require certain animals to pollinate them. Like the bee with the fuzz on his back, when he goes in and touches certain parts of the flower, the stamen will come down and deposit the pollen on the bee's back. How did the stamen learn to do that? It works. It works really, that's amazing. You'd almost want to think God did it if you didn't know better. 
So I think you could, the good question, you could find literally probably into the millions of symbiotic relationships if you look for it. And when I see them, I just give God the glory. They praise God. You're smart. Thank you so much. Kent, uh, question was for you, AJ. You get the last word. Well, you could take that same argument and say that all of those symbiotic relationships were created by Allah. So we should praise Allah and it would be just as valid. Okay, let's uh, let's do one last question in order to wind it up at the two hour mark. I do appreciate, uh, you know, the time from both uh, AJ and Kent. So uh, firstly, before the last question, I will say it looks like there's an after show. So any after shows for any of our debates, you just let me know. And of course, I will uh, advertise them. So logical, plausible, probable. Appreciate all your super chats tonight, brother, uh, your feedback. And also uh, it looks like there's an after show. Uh, kicking off right after this debate. So here we go. Uh, last question from Ken Rock. Ken Rock is here in the chat, has debated Kent a couple times, and he has a question for you. He says, isn't the definition of science something that can be tested and also have predictions made about it? Well, as I mentioned, you can look up the definition of science for the last several hundred years in old dictionaries. I collect old dictionaries, too. Uh, it says, what do we know? based on observation, experimentation, and testing. That's science. Now, science is useful for a lot of things to, uh, that may go outside that field. Uh, you know, like nobody knows for sure what gravity is. We know what it does. We can test it in you know, 9.8 meters per second or 32 feet per second per second on the surface of the planet Earth, different on different planets. But that's, nobody really knows what it is. So, so science is limited to what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. That's, I don't think anybody has come up with a better definition. Does, but these, these, these guys keep trying to twist the definition of science to include their religion. That's what's silly about it. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you, Kent. Uh, go ahead, AJ. Well, I'm confused because Kent says that atheism is a religion and evolution is a religion. So I guess I have two religions. But the, the definition of science uh, that I've seen on Google is saying that it's the study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. So science isn't just what we know. It's about learning things that we don't know yet. Okay. Thank you, AJ. And uh, Kent, you get the final word. Oh, that, that's a good point. And I would agree. There's the science is the study of things that we take what we do know and try to figure out what, what do we not know? You know, can we extrapolate this? And sometimes we do really good, sometimes not too good, but, uh, uh, all the science tells us dogs produce dogs, nothing else other than that. So if somebody wishes to believe otherwise, that they've just really left science and gone to religion. I found my whole section on seminar part seven about soft dinosaur tissue. Wow. It's not just one. It's hundreds of examples. Nature magazine, Discover magazine, uh, National Geographic, uh, all kinds of people, science magazine, uh, nature magazine, five. I think you're mistaken, AJ. You need to study this a little further. Soft dinosaur tissue, not just blood cells co coated in iron. Soft dinosaur tissue has been found. Christian Science Monitor, let's see. Uh, so I'll, get my, I'll send it off to you if you'd like. Of course, I don't think you want an answer to that one. But okay, go ahead. Okay, it's been uh, two hours, Donnie. It's been two hours. I'm old. I'm tired. I'm ready to go to bed. So how much more? That's it. You stole uh, the words right out of my mouth, brother. That was the last question that we're going to uh, get to. I had a double header last night, so we did five hours of debates uh, last night, two hours today, and we've got another one tomorrow but uh, with Kent again. So three in a, uh, in a row, Kent. You're a busy man. So again, uh, Atheist Jr., Kent, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this was an epic debate, one to remember. Uh, any final words you gentlemen want to say before we shut it down? Uh, no, just, um, you, you know, if anybody in the chat, uh, is seeing me for the first time, you can go check out my channel, uh, just atheist junior and, you know, check out my videos and consider subscribing or follow me on Twitter. And Kent. Well, yes. And check out my, uh, website, drdino.com, D-R-E-I-N-O and my YouTube channel, Kent Hovind official and AJ, God loves you. And I'm trying. Aw. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for keeping it fun and easy to moderate. So uh, blessings. Thank you to the chat. Of course, as always, I stick around for two minutes. So to the debaters, thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon.
All right, there we go. That's that's two hours. I mean, time has flown by. I've been looking forward to this uh, fantastic debate since we uh, since we scheduled it, and it did not disappoint. And I do want to give the debaters a shout out. They're no longer here, but I want to give them a shout out, AJ and Kent, for making uh, my job very easy. Uh, you know, it was it was of course lively at times, but this is an important topic, and passion is is appreciated and, and expected. So this was a, a great debate. Uh, share this content around, guys. Critical thinking is important. The truth is important. And um, we went two hours. So uh, you know that is is a solid debate. And, you know, if we were to get to every single question, we'd be here for 10 hours. So I do want to thank uh, our audience here. You know, one of the best audiences out there because, you know, I, I love how engaged you guys are in these important debates and just how many uh, fantastic questions that come in. And I do apologize for the questions we could not get to. And, um, you know, I do want to thank everybody for the super stickers, super chats, and also just, uh, you know, to let you know, you know, if, if we get super chats that come in, I do appreciate the donations, of course, the support. But if, if if they're more so just kind of like a comment that is what I perceive as maybe disrespectful to one of the debaters or uh, attacking the debaters, you know, again, I appreciate the super chat, but it, it's just it, it might not be fitting uh, for the debate. So, again, do apologize for any questions, comments we did not get to. But uh, that being said, uh, that's three debates now in two nights. OK, so last night we had two awesome debates. Uh, Snake was right in Kent. OK, that was a ton of fun. Um, and then right after that, we had James W., and T Rock, Noah's Flood, Noah's Ark. Again, this one was this one went over three hours. So, uh, you know, I think we did a, an hour of audience Q and A for that specific debate. Um, so, I mean, to the debaters there for sure. Thank you for your time. And then, of course, tonight the debate that everybody's been waiting for and did not disappoint: Atheist Junior, Doctor Dino, and we had uh, roughly 400 people in the chat the entire time. So, again, thank you so much for showing up to this awesome debate tomorrow. Uh, I pointed out we've got four debates in three nights, so tomorrow concludes the three night four debate. Um, series, I guess you could say. This one will be uh, Chapter 3, Endgame, Wade the Wizard, and uh, Dr. Dino. The Evolution Debate Challenge series continues. Pure Aussie Gold, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, this was definitely uh, a lot of fun. I see Super Chats coming in. So Christ is King, thank you so much uh, for the, the, the Super Sticker. SWE, thank you for all your uh, support and uh super chats and questions um cheryl yes or, or not on topic so um appreciate that i do want to make sure i get to the questions that are that are the most on topic especially uh for debates here on the evolution debate challenge series we do uh you know ha have a time limit an agreed upon time limit for them we like them to go between 90 minutes and two hours i think there's only been one or two times where we actually uh managed to uh conclude the debate at the 90 minute mark uh typically they've been going two hours because we get so many awesome questions super chats and i do want to make sure that i get to all the super chats okay so anyways that being said thanks again for tuning in that's all that comes to mind and uh, head on over to a Logical Plausible Probables channel. Looks like he's having an after show, which I may join a little bit later. Um, but uh, given the doubleheader last night, the epic debate tonight, I am going to just chill out for a little bit. And we will see you all later, uh, specifically tomorrow night. Wade the Wizard, Dr. Dino, Evolution Debate Challenge Series continues. God bless all.